Welcome to Pathology Central Key Concepts. The topic of this video is the muscular dystrophies. Now there are a wide range of muscular dystrophies. The most common of these are due to mutations in the gene that encodes the protein dystrophin, and these are also referred to as the dystrophinopathies. So with that in mind, I will begin by reviewing the role of dystrophin, then compare and contrast Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophies, which are also dystrophinopathies, and then finish by discussing the muscular dystrophies that are due to proteins other than dystrophin. So muscular dystrophies are inherited disorders of skeletal muscle that are characterized by progressive muscle damage. Although we typically think of them as diseases that uh, present in childhood, they may actually uh, present as late as uh, adulthood in the 60s. The most common of these are the X-linked uh, muscular dystrophies that are associated with mutations in the gene that encodes dystrophin, and these are sometimes referred to as the dystrophinopathies. These include Duchenne muscular dystrophy and Becker muscular dystrophy. Now there's a wide range of other muscular dystrophies that show a variety of inheritance patterns and that are due to other proteins in the dystrophin glycoprotein complex, as well as proteins involved in structural stability, signaling, etc. So let's turn our attention first to dystrophin, which is one of the largest human genes at 2.3 million base pairs and 79 exons. And the significance of this is that with this great size, we have an increased risk of random mutation. Uh, the gene itself is located on the X chromosome, uh, and the protein is part of the dystrophin glycoprotein complex. Uh, its role is to link the cytoskeleton within the myofiber to the basement membrane outside the cell through the sarcoglycans and dystroglycans. This will help it to stabilize the myofiber and the cell membrane during muscle contraction. Now, it also uh, plays a role uh, with its binding to a signaling complex that links to neuronal nitric oxide synthetase, or NNOS, and caviolin. Uh, and it is expressed not just in skeletal muscle, but also cardiac muscle and central nervous system, which is why we can see uh, some symptoms uh, in patients who have mutations uh, in this protein. Now, this is uh, the uh, figure that is in Chapter 20 of Robbins and Kumar Basic Pathology, the section on the muscular dystrophies. So we're going to look at this, and then we're going to look at this in a slightly broader context. Uh, so what you can see here is that we have the dystrophin protein, uh, which plays uh, several roles. Here it is bound to its signaling complex, uh, linking to NNOS and caviolin. But it also binds here to our psychoglycans and dystroglycans, and through them to laminin-2 and the basinal uh, lamina outside the cell. And I just want to show you here uh, some of the mutations uh, that can cause uh, diseases, cause these muscular dystrophies. So uh, dystrophin, as I mentioned, is something we see in the X-linked Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy. Uh, mutations in caviolin or our sarcoglycans uh, can result in uh, autosomal limb girdle muscular dystrophies, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, and then uh, mutations in alpha-2 laminin uh, can result in an autosomal uh, recessive congenital muscular dystrophy. Now, looking at dystrophin here, it might be difficult to get an idea of how it plays a role in skeletal muscle. So let's take a look at this figure from the uh, cardiac pathology chapter of Robbins and Kumar Basic Pathology. Uh, the various uh, colors here uh, relate to the cardiomyopathies, but that's not what we're focusing on. What we want to look at here is dystrophin, how it connects to a desmin and thereby uh, interacts with our sarcomere. Uh, and then it also shows here our dystrophin-associated glycoproteins and our link to the extracellular matrix. Uh, there's one other protein I want to bring to your attention. It's called lamin AC, uh, and we'll be talking about this at the end of the video when uh, we discuss Emery Dreyfus muscular dystrophy. But I think this image is useful to put uh, all of these proteins into their context. So when we get defects in dystrophin function, uh, we can get a variety of different uh, effects. So in skeletal muscle, it will result in small membrane tears that will result in an influx of calcium ions. Uh, this, over time, will lead to uh, myofiber degeneration and the muscle weakness that characterizes the dystrophinopathies. In addition, the heart can be affected, uh, resulting in a cardiomyopathy or arrhythmias, which we can typically see in our older patients. Uh, some patients uh, with the dystrophinopathies have cognitive impairment as well as learning disabilities. So now let's turn our focus to the more common of uh, the muscular dystrophies, Duchenne uh, muscular dystrophy, which accounts for about 1 in 3,500 live male births with an incidence of about 2 in 10,000 in the United States. 
Now, the etiology of this is that we have deletions or frame shift mutations that result in a complete loss of dystrophin function. This is different from what we will see in Becker muscular dystrophy in which we maintain some function. So in these patients, we have absolutely no dystrophin uh, that is functional. These uh, children will appear healthy at birth and meet their early milestones, though they may have some delay in walking. Uh, but weakness will begin first in the pelvic girdle muscles, and I'll show you uh, the uh, maneuvers that some of these children will use in order to uh, rise to uh, standing. And over time, this will progress uh, to the shoulder girdle. Uh, the uh, disease is relentlessly uh, progressive and invariably fatal with death uh, at the age of 25 to 30 years, typically due to respiratory insufficiency, uh, pulmonary infection, or heart failure. So the clinical features uh, of uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy uh, and also what we can see with uh, Becker muscular dystrophy is initially a uh, difficulty rising from the floor. This is because we typically will use uh, our pelvic girdle muscles uh, to rise. Uh, and I'll show you an example of this on the next slide. We can also get what's referred to as pseudohypertrophy of the calf muscles. Uh, typically, there will be atrophy of other muscles, but in the calf muscles, we will see replacement uh, of uh, skeletal myocytes uh, with fat uh, and fibrosis. Uh, because of unopposed uh, action of some muscles, we'll get joint contractures, which can also lead to scoliosis, uh, and scoliosis can lead to decreased pulmonary function, and we can also get sleep hypoventilation. Now, this is uh, something that's referred to as the Gower maneuver. This is something that a parent might describe uh, that they see their child employing in order to rise from, uh, from uh, the prone position. Uh, instead of being able to simply uh, flex at the hips and use the legs to be, uh, come upright, uh, children have to use uh, their uh, shoulder muscles, uh, which are at this point still uh, functional, uh, to slowly rise. And then you can see here where they put uh, the, the hand on the thigh or both hands on the knees in order to push uh, upright to the standing position. Uh, this is an image showing a pseudohypertrophy of the calf muscles. You can see a little bit of atrophy here in the thighs. These are two brothers, both of whom uh, have uh, uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. You can see that we have uh, increased uh, pseudohypertrophy in the older boy. And this is due to uh, muscle tissue replacement by collagen and fat cells. This is sometimes referred to as fatty replacement. And then to appreciate the postural changes, uh, you can see here, these are again two brothers, so the uh, effects are more pronounced in the older boy. Uh, we have this compensatory posture due to gluteal weakness with a widened stance and, and angling uh, forward uh, of the abdomen. Uh, you can appreciate here the lordosis uh, as well. So what do we see microscopically? It depends on when we are biopsying uh, the patient. Uh, so uh, early, we will see uh, segmental myofiber degeneration and regeneration, uh, as well as scattered atrophic myofibers. There may be a little bit of endomysial fibrosis. Overall, fascicular architecture will be maintained. Over time, however, we will get muscle tissue replacement by fat and collagen, see uh, variability in our myocyte size and shape, and we will lose uh, our fascicular architecture. Uh, so here are uh, two micrographs, one from uh, a three-year-old uh, boy and one from his uh, brother. And you can see in the uh, younger child that we uh, have variation in the size and shape of our skeletal myocytes. Uh, we have uh, this uh, section here maintaining our fascicular architecture of regenerating uh, uh, skeletal myocytes. Uh, they're more basophilic uh, as they're regenerating. And there is a small amount of endomysial fibrosis, uh, which you can appreciate here is this pink uh, interweaving uh, through the uh, myocytes. Uh, what we can see in his older brother is uh, extraordinary variation in the size and shape of the myocytes from very enlarged uh, hypertrophic myocytes uh, to uh, atrophic and regenerating myocytes. We also have uh, endomysial fibrosis, which is quite prominent, as well as this fatty replacement. Now, a significant finding that we can appreciate with immunohistochemistry is when we look uh, for the dystrophin protein. Now, as I mentioned, in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, we get complete loss uh, of dystrophin, a uh, functional dystrophin. So what we can see here in a wild-type patient, first of all, you can appreciate uh, that all of the skeletal myocytes are the same size and shape, and they have this beautiful uh, membranous staining uh, with dystrophin. 
Uh, by contrast, what we see in an individual with Duchenne muscular dystrophy is extraordinary variation in size and shape of our skeletal myocytes, abundant endomysial fibrosis, and complete absence of the dystrophin protein. So this brings us now to Becker muscular dystrophy, which is much less common than Duchenne muscular dystrophy, uh, about uh, 0.26 uh, per 10,000 males uh, in the United States. And what we see in Becker muscular dystrophy is that we have mutations that still affect uh, the dystrophin protein, but it retains partial function. Uh, because we have partial function, uh, this uh, has a number of uh, effects. For example, Becker muscular dystrophy tends to present uh, in later childhood, adolescence, and all the way up to adulthood with an age range of 5 to 60 years. And I highlight this because I don't want you to think that the muscular dystrophy is only present in children. You may see this in an older adult. Uh, it has a slower progression than Duchenne muscular dystrophy, again, because we retain our partial function, and life expectancy is near normal. And the easiest way to visualize the difference uh, between Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy is going to be, again, looking at our immunohistochemistry for dystrophin. So we can see here uh, wild type uh, circumferential staining, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, complete absence of dystrophin. And then in Becker muscular dystrophy, you can see this brown staining is highlighting that there is some residual uh, functional dystrophin. So how do we make the diagnosis? Uh, first, it's important uh, to do a careful clinical history, which will evoke uh, stories perhaps of a, a child who is becoming increasingly clumsy and falling more often uh, due to weakness uh, in the pelvic girdle muscles. Uh, then uh, you will notice the uh, pseudohypertrophy uh, on physical exam. You also want to get a family history since this is an X-linked disease. We can do uh, laboratory tests, uh, which can show an increase in creatine kinase. Uh, this is a cytosolic uh, enzyme in a skeletal muscle that will be released with myocyte damage. Muscle biopsy with immunohistochemistry can be useful, and of course, we always have genetic analysis. Now, this brings us to what I refer to as the other muscular dystrophies, uh, which are uh, somewhat less common, uh, but which have some interesting uh, presentations and which you should be aware of since they can present uh, in a variety uh, of different uh, ways. Let's begin with myotonic dystrophy. Myotonia is defined as sustained involuntary contraction of a muscle group. Uh, this disease has autosomal dominant inheritance due to mutations uh, in the gene that encodes the protein dystrophia myotonica protein kinase, or DMPK. Uh, what is uh, significant about this particular disease is that this is a trinucleotide repeat expansion disease, uh, similar to what we see with Huntington disease. And in uh, healthy individuals, they may have uh, 5 to 37 of these CTG repeats. But in individuals with the disease, uh, they will have 45 to several thousand of these CTG repeats. Patients will typically present with gait abnormalities uh, in late childhood, uh, which will then progress to weakness of the intrinsic muscles of the hands and wrists. Uh, there are a variety of other uh, findings, uh, so we can get uh, potentially fatal cardiac arrhythmias. Patients may have cataracts as well as a variety of endocrinopathies. The next category of diseases is actually a group of diseases that are referred to as the limb girdle muscular dystrophies. Uh, and depending on which of these uh, we're uh, looking at, the uh, incidence runs from 1 in 14,500 to 1 in 123,000, so fairly uncommon. Again, we have weakness of our proximal muscles. Uh, this collection of diseases uh, is due to a variety of heterogeneous causes. Uh, so we can see involvement of the sarcoglycans of the dystrophin glycoprotein complex, or caviolin. So I showed this to you uh, in that earlier figure, as well as defects in the post-translational uh, post modification of dystroglycan. So the muscles that are affected are going to be the proximal muscles of the extremities as well as uh, your trunk muscles. Now, most patients uh, will live to adulthood, but they do have a shortened life expectancy. Uh, the uh, next entity is Emery-Dreyfus muscular dystrophy, which I invoked uh, earlier when we looked at the figure of the different proteins uh, in skeletal muscle. Uh, this is, again, a rare disease, uh, 1.3 to 2 per 100,000 patients. And it has a, a triad of symptoms, slow, a slowly progressive humeral perineal weakness, a cardiomyopathy associated with conduction defects that leads to sudden cardiac death in about 40% of patients, and early contractures of a variety of uh, joints, 
uh, particularly the Achilles tendon, uh, spine, and elbows. Uh, and there are both X-linked and autosomal forms of this disease. The X-linked uh, variant is due to mutations in the EMD1 gene, which encodes emerin, whereas the autosomal form is due to mutations in the EMD2 gene, which encodes lamin AC, which I showed you in that earlier figure. Uh, both of these uh, proteins localize uh, to the interface of the nuclear membrane and are thought to help maintain nuclear shape and mechanical stability during contraction. The final entity I'd like to discuss is called facioscapulohumeral dystrophy. Uh, this is slightly more common with uh, an, uh, an incidence of 1 in 8,000 uh, equal uh, distribution in males and females. This is an autosomal dominant disease due to uh, expression of DUX4. This is a transcription factor that is typically repressed in adult tissues, but with this expression, uh, we get an overexpression of the DUX4 target genes, uh, many of which are involved in normal skeletal muscle function. Patients uh, are typically symptomatic by the age of 20, and this is characterized by weakness in the facial muscles uh, and shoulders. Uh, life expectancy is normal for most. Uh, so as always, uh, I'd like to uh, finish up with a few questions so you can review the material I just covered. I hope that uh, this has been useful. Uh, please do subscribe. I certainly do appreciate it. Thank you very much for your time and attention.